Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Good morning, everyone. I am Jim Lindsay, Director of Studies here at the Council on Foreign Relations. On behalf of Richard Haas, the President of CFR, and our partners in today's event, uh, Georgetown University Center for Peace and Security Studies and the International Center uh, for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence. I want to welcome you to our symposium here today, U United Kingdom and U.S. Approaches in Countering uh, Radicalization. In putting together a conference like the one we have today, uh, we have a, a big debt of gratitude and thanks to give a number of people and I'd like to single them out here. Uh, on behalf of Georgetown University, uh, I would like to thank Thomas Calaris uh, for his unwavering support for today's symposium uh, and the George T. Calaris Fund for Intelligence Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, the fund is named in honor of Tom's father, an unsung hero of the U.S. intelligence services, and the fund invests in the future of intelligence professionals and intelligence studies at Georgetown Center for Peace and Security Studies. Uh, CFR would also uh, like to thank longtime member and supporter Rita Hauser. Uh, Rita is an international lawyer who is deeply involved in intelligence work uh, through her service on the President's uh, Intelligence Advisory Board. Rita, thank you very much for all your support. Uh, I would also like to thank Georgetown University's uh, Bruce Hoffman uh, and Ellen McHugh, uh, Henry Sweetbaum, and Peter Newman of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization. I also have some thanks to my colleagues here at CFR, led by Ed Hussein and Steve Simon. Uh, in addition, uh, it takes a lot of people working in the background to make an event like today happen. Uh, and my colleague, Nancy Badertha, uh, heads up a truly outstanding uh, meetings team here. So I want to thank Nancy, uh, Chris Tuttle, Emily McLeod, Jeff Gullo, Allison Blau, and uh, Kay Collins for pulling today's conference together. I have a couple of housekeeping uh, details to go over. First, uh, today's sessions are all on the record, uh, with two exceptions. The exceptions are session two on violent radicalization, key trends and developments, and session six, new frontiers countering online radicalization. I would also politely request that if you have a BlackBerry, PDA, any other uh, electronic device that sends or receives signals, if you could please turn it off right now uh, so that it will not interfere with our sound system and put out uh, squealing, uh, very painful uh, sounds over the speakers. So I would appreciate uh, that. Why are we having uh, today's symposium? Uh, the answer is fairly straightforward. The United States is experiencing a significant increase in violent Islamic extremism, uh, both abroad and at home. Now, ongoing events in the Middle East are a cause for concern about the probable rise of Islamic radicalism, uh, at least in the short term. At home, we have more and more instances of Americans either plotting attacks against their fellow Americans or attempting to travel overseas to receive terrorist training. The Fort Hood shooting in November of 2009 and the near successful car bombing in Times Square in May 2010 are the most dramatic illustrations of this trend. We are seeking in today's uh, event uh, to bring together leading officials and experts from the United Kingdom and the United States to take stock, to exchange best practices and to develop fresh ideas for tackling some of the most important issues in the current debate. And I owe a great debt of gratitude to uh, our British colleagues who travel a considerable distance to get here this morning. I only had to take a metro uh, subway ride. Uh, they had to fly a, a long way. Uh, we are honored uh, to begin today's conversation with a truly distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Baroness Pauline Neville Jones. Uh, the United Kingdom's Minister of State responsible for security and counterterrorism. Minister Neville Jones 
has had a distinguished 30-year career as a diplomat, serving in posts around the world, including the former Rhodesia, Singapore, Washington, uh, and Bonn. Uh, she was also uh, seconded to the European Commission. Uh, Minister Neville Jones has held her current position uh, since May of 2010. And with that, I would invite uh, Minister Neville Jones to come to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, as uh, uh, just been noted, I've spent time in my in my past in in Washington, um, and I just want to say what a pleasure it is uh, to come back. Uh, I think that anybody who has spent time here uh, seldom goes away uh, feeling that that uh, they will ever entirely shake off the uh, the allure uh, of of this town, and uh, it is it is good to be here, and. As somebody who you know, has had some experience in, in this subject, and I understand that uh, the administration is likely to be issuing a, a strategy in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this policy area quite shortly, I hope I can uh, shed some light at any rate on the UK experience. And I shall be talking from the point of view, obviously, of UK experience. Not everything that we've done or not everything that we've experienced is necessarily, necessarily relevant to the American context. Uh, but I do think there are some probably some problem, uh, some uh, common uh, both problems and solutions that we uh, might be able to uh, share and uh, respectively benefit from. And it is with that spirit that I'm going to talk the, this morning. And as, as was well said, I, um, I bear this rather portentous title of, of uh, Minister for Security and Counterterrorism. Um, and uh, in, as a result of that, um, have focused uh, quite considerably uh, since uh, the coalition came into office last May uh, in uh, our approach to uh, radicalization and countering it um, because we do regard it as a key part of any successful strategy, and it's that uh, that I will now focus on. And I suppose it's worth starting, of course, from it, you know, where does this story all begin? But one thing's very clear, that... Uh, terrorism isn't just a threat which is external to Western countries. It's uh, not simply a foreign menace that comes from overseas to strike our cities. Uh, uh, it can and it does, as we now know, come from within our own countries and from inside our own populations. And I think it's fair to say that you know, every single country in the West needs to wake up to what's happening within our own borders. And this means that we must strengthen the security aspects of our response, the capacity and capabilities of our intelligence agencies and of our law enforcement officers, all part of the picture. But it's only part of the solution, and we do have to get also to the root. And we must tackle the ideology that fuels and drives radicalization and the circumstances which give that ideology appeal. We need to act against the existence of a pervasive, perverse, and pernicious political ideology, which is Islamist extremism. Now, let me stress emphatically that this does not mean tackling the religion of Islam, which is one of the great religions of the world. Uh, those on the right-wing extremist fringe who argue that is exactly what we should do, uh, but they have it wrong. Those who say that the West and Islam are eternally irreconcilable have more in common with the Islamist extremists uh, than they might like to think. For it's the very same uh, argument, of course, advanced by Al-Qaeda. And they do have it wrong. We need to work with mainstream Islam. Moreover, the events of last week in North Africa, in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, in Libya, have demonstrated that the populations of Muslim countries themselves see no incompatibility, and that they crave the freedoms that they see us in the West enjoying. In our, and, and that's very important. In our foreign and our, and, and our domestic policies, it should be a cardinal tenet that, domestic, that dem democratic freedoms and Islam are companions and not opponents. 
Now, as the British Prime Minister made clear in a recent speech which he gave at the Munich Security Conference, Islamist extremist ideology is the problem. Islam is not. So that brings us to the, uh, onto the question of what is it uh, about uh, Islamist extremist ideology which can lead ultimately to terrorism. Clearly, rejection of democratic values need not of itself lead to violence. By no means all Islamists are terrorists. So how does the process of radicalization work? Now, there's been a great deal of academic research in universities and think tanks on radicalization. And our and your intelligence agencies have also used their knowledge and covert information to try to come up with an answer. And what emerges is the unremarkable conclusion that there is no single cause. Our work in Britain suggests that radicalization is driven by an, by an ideology which claims that Muslims around the world are being oppressed and, and this is the key bit of the argument, which then legitimizes violence in their supposed defense. This legitimization of violence is often coupled with a political vision, the restoration of the caliphate, based on a purported reading of scriptures. Now this is a revolutionary message, and this revolutionary message is broadcast and amplified by a global network of influential propagandists who make extensive use of the internet to penetrate societies across the globe. And it finds an audience among in individuals with specific personal vulnerabilities which make that ideology seem both attractive and compelling. Where those vulnerable individuals are part of a community, be it an actual community or a virtual community, where extremist views are widely accepted, the legitimization of violence becomes easy and the path to terrorism is thereby smoothed. And we know in the UK from our own citizenship surveys I'll give you an example, that in situations where people believe that ethnic and faith groups should not mix, and where people are segregated from the rest of society, they are more likely to accept the extremist arguments. And this is then liable to become an enabling context in which the espousal of violence is made easy. Well-crafted online jihadist messaging has contributed powerfully to the perception of a single global terrorist campaign, which in fact is quite often carried on by otherwise separate terrorist groups, not always with the same interests or identities. And we underestimate such a potent infrastructure and such a superficially powerful ideology at our peril. And as our Prime Minister put it, we must confront and we must undermine it. This will be a concerted effort from all governments, institutions and citizens, all of us. Now in the UK, we've had for some years a strategy to counter this radicalization to stop people becoming terrorists. There are parallels with the countering violent extremism programs which are being run in this country and about which I think Jane Lute will be talking uh, later in the day. Uh, our strategy, which is called PREVENT, is a key component of a broader strategy designed to counter all aspects of terrorism, which is called CONTEST. And it's fair to say uh, that these days in many places, the, the police and the local Muslim communities are now more willing to talk to each other frankly and constructively than previously about the threat of terrorism, the dangers of radicalization, and how we should try to reduce them and the level of awareness of the dangers is much greater, and there is greater sense of shared purpose than was once the case. Our information and understanding is slowly getting better. The police have a mandate grounded in their community policing role to locate vulnerable individuals and to intervene to help them, and with, along with the cooperation of local government and voluntary community bodies. And community-based groups have been engaged to provide anti- and de-radicalization services. And we can report some successes in stopping people being radicalized or drawn into terrorism. However, there is a however. 
we do think that the mistakes have blotted out a good deal of the progress. There have been accusations of stigmatization and of the police spying on Muslim communities and a perception which has been lent false color uh, by the legitimate role of the police in personal interventions. You can see how easy it is actually to mistake the one for the other, either uh, willfully or unwittingly. The government has also been accused of, not of being only interested in, Mus in British Muslims insofar as they represented a terrorist threat and that their mainstream needs like health or education or housing were of no concern. The government, it was said, was securitizing its approach to Muslim communities. The result of this is that Prevent has gradually lost the trust and goodwill of many in the very communities that was designed to help. More widely, it's being criticized also for trying to do too many things at once, for wasting money, and also for spending it on the wrong projects. And it was clear that compared with the other parts of our counterterrorism strategy, to in, when the incoming coalition came in, that we had to do something about this, because Prevent wasn't working and could be vastly improved. And so that is what we have been focusing on. Now, our first conclusion was that the segregation of communities was actually becoming more pronounced, and the Prevent was in the wrong vehicle, as it was designed, to counter this. Indeed, and let's set in a wider policy context, I think it's clear that special programs are liable to have the effect opposite from that intended. Far from uniting, they have a tendency to isolate, leading to accusations of stigmatization. And we reckon that we needed a unity strategy, a strategy for integration in its own right, of which prevent would then be a component part rather than the other way around. And in his Munich speech in February, the British Prime Minister said, quote, we must build stronger societies with stronger identities at home. He criticized past government policies of state multiculturalism, which encouraged differentiation between communities instead, as we see the task, of actively fostering a sense of what we share and what we value. I want to give you an example of the kind of things we think we need to do. As part of the big society program, the government is introducing uh, the National Citizen Service, in which 16-year-olds from all backgrounds and walks of life will spend two months living and working together. We want to create a vision of a society to which all, including young Muslims, feel they want to belong and to participate in. And we believe there's something that we can learn here from America. You have created in your country a palpable sense of national identity, an American dream, to which all can aspire, and an acceptance of immigrant communities as Americans. And it's a task that the British government seeks to create a similar sense of shared identity in our country. And we need this anyway, and it stands independently of counterterrorism. It is, however, the framework within which we will challenge nonviolent and violent extremist <laughs> views. So if our values mean anything, they must be equal to taking on opposing opinions, however hostile, in open debate. And we won't discriminate. We will confront all forms of, of extremism, from far left to far right, from neo-fascist to militant separatist. The government will work actively in this task with those of all faiths and viewpoints who share our values. We will not rely on extremists to combat violence merely because they do, they do not espouse violence themselves. And at the same time, we will not not permit the advocacy of violence. We have laws against this, which we will enforce. And we will exclude from the UK those from abroad who have a track record of preaching or advocating violence. Our revised prevent strategy will be implemented within the broad, this broad context. Uh, it will be more narrowly focused on violent extremism and the pathways that lead to the espousal of violence. And since what is at issue is people and networks that they work and live in, it will be more granular in its approach, dealing with people. We need also to remember 
that the threat we face from terrorism is constantly evolving and that we need to be flexible in our response. Now at the core of the revised prevent will be three I's, ideology, institutions and individuals. The ideology that supports terrorism and those who promote it. The institutions where radicalization may occur, which will be crucial in, and which will also be crucial in disrupting its impact. And the individuals who are vulnerable to radicalization. And I want to say a little bit more about each of these and why they're important. First of all, ideology. Well, challenging extremism is part of the normal functioning of democratic society. And as I've made clear, it finds an important place in our wider integration strategy. But when it comes to the advocacy of violence and its espousal, a concerted response is required, which must be more focused and specialized than can be the case in the normal cut and thrust of democratic debate. A sustained anti and counter terrorist message is called for. Much can and, and should be done at the local level by communities themselves and Prevent does focus on this, and it funds the project. As I mentioned at the outset, the exploitation of the internet also needs to be at the center of our attention. This is a very serious issue. The internet plays an ever more significant role in the sedulous promotion of terrorism. We know that in the UK, groups gather to view the preaching of violent men located many thousands of miles away, and that this does have a powerful effect on young minds. We know that individuals have been radicalized to the point of being willing to kill and have tried to do this as a result of viewing websites carrying such material. British MP suffered serious, um, uh, serious injury in this way from a woman who came to see him in his constituency office. And this is not just a stab at the man, it is a stab at, the open, at open democracy. And we must take action to stem this flow of poison, which comes across borders and it requires international action. Child pornography on the internet stimulates evil activity in real life and we go after it. And we believe that we should go after websites and other internet activity, activity which enables or fosters terrorism. We welcome the increasing awareness on the part of internet providers of the dangers of such material and we look forward to working with partners on effective action. And for example, I'll give you an example, Google has now added a referral flag on YouTube for content which promotes terrorism, and we applaud this. Government can also carry out activity directly, such as helping build the capacity of civil society organizations who are campaigning to build on the awareness of moderate organizations, encouraging the creation of websites that offer online topical advice for young Muslims and engaging an online debate about extremist narrative and, and uh, narratives and ideologies get going at the local level. And we also hope that civil society and concerned of individuals directly will also be active. My second point, institutions. Now our experience suggests that certain institutions, such as prisons, universities and colleges, and indeed mosques, may be especially vulnerable to the influence of charismatic radicalizers. Our universities and colleges are conscious of their dedication to unfettered academic research and a freedom of expression. And my goodness, the government respects this and will defend the rights of free speech as we will defend the rights, all citizens' rights to free speech. But we do believe that alongside this, there is a responsibility which universities carry to ensure that these freedoms are not exploited and perverted by speakers on or off campus, and that the pastoral care of students is taken seriously, and that individuals needing help and guidance are spotted, and that assistance is available to them. And the training of English-speaking imams as part of pastoral care is absolutely fundamental to bonding the faith of young Muslims to the Western social context in which they find themselves. The UK, and I just want to turn briefly to schools, the UK has a uh, thriving faith uh, school sector which offers some of the best education available. 
and that includes Muslim schools which receive public funding, and we're not going to stop that. But we will seek to maintain national standards of instruction in those schools, as in all others. Now, Muslims in Britain are disproportionately represented in our prisons. We need to ensure that prison does not become an incubator of violent extremism, the closed society. The UK is developing programmes for prisoners, both inside and on release, to increase the likelihood of successful disruption of attempts at radicalisation and recruitment, and of the chances of successful rehabilitation and reintegration into society. I wouldn't like to claim this is easy, but it is very important. So, measures have often, mosques have often been, I think, seen as part of the problem. Uh, and there have been, and there still are, instances of this. Today, I think the issue is less one of mosques harbouring preachers being suspected of fostering violent extremism, let alone being guilty of it. It's more, in our view, one of a gap of confidence that still exists between the mosque and local authorities and the police. And this is a gap which it will be vital, vital to close if we are to be successful in dealing with my third eye, which is individuals. You can see that the cooperation between local mosques and, and local communities and local authorities is very important. Individuals. Those individuals who are on the path to radicalization don't exist in a vacuum. They live in neighborhoods. They meet friends and family. They use shops and businesses, and they come into contact with local community sector workers, such as teachers, nurses, or community police officers. And these are individuals who may well be placed, especially if trained, and that's one of the things we do, to notice changes in behavior. Uh, and it's when working with local community organizations or community groups who can provide personal de-radicalization uh, de interventions uh, that we get some of the best results. And these, this is an invaluable route. And it is crucial, obviously, to have the support of local Muslim leaders, uh, vital, frankly, to long-term success. So we've already had quite a bit of experience of this sort of work. And as I say, we found it to be helpful and cost-effective. Hundreds of people have now been re referred through our flagship channel program. Uh, this type of multi-agency intervention, uh, call channel, is enormously more cost-effective than maintaining an MI5 investigation or, or dealing with the consequences of a successful attack. That's why prevent is such an important preemptive part of the broader strategy. And let me emphasize, Channel is emphatically not about criminalizing people who have not committed an offense. It is about helping them, and it's about drawing them back from the danger of radicalization and the espousal of violence. But I think I ought to draw to uh, a conclusion. What I would say is, you know, the agenda ahead of us is a full one. Uh, we have to be determined and persevering and not expect, I think, lots of quick wins. What we want to do is to turn the propaganda tide, get from the back foot to the front foot. We have to create the values and institutions accepted by the whole of society, not just abroad, which is another task, but also obviously at home. We believe it can be done, and that in the UK, within the broader program of strengthening our collective identity, Prevent has a key role to play in dissuading people from being drawn by the siren message of violent jihad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for a, a thoughtful set of remarks. I'd, I'd like to begin with an issue you raised in your remarks about the role of integration and the importance of mm. national identity. Uh, you quite nicely complimented Americans on a uh, strong sense of national identity and the great pride that Americans have in uh, incorporating immigrants in a society. Uh, and I think because of that, for many years, Americans thought that they were immune from the risk of homegrown radicalization. Uh, but recently, we've been forced to grapple with this problem. Why do you think it is that, that America is facing this 
challenge given that it has uh, this history of incorporating immigrants? Well, I, think, I think it's necessary but not sufficient is probably my, my first answer. Uh, and we don't have enough of it. And so as, as we think that actually it is the framework within which you can then deal with a specific problem, uh, you know, that's why we have laid a lot of emphasis on that necessary framework. Uh, I think it's not sufficient because I hope as I, I tried to make clear, uh, there is you know, a healthy democracy will conduct a, you know, a, a really strong cut and thrust and you will argue through your values and you will, uh, and, and it's a very, very important part of living your, no, living your beliefs. Uh, but uh, if you get to, when it comes to uh, people who are uh, preaching to potentially rather closed communities uh, and who have successfully uh, drawn people away from listening to that democratic debate, participating in that democratic debate, uh, being willing, uh, uh, being you know, willing um, components of society, and we have some of that. Uh, then it's very important actually to carry out, and I think, you know, specific interventions designed actually to get at that kind of community. Uh, and that is where I think we, we feel that uh, we have to have a specific program. It works best when it is conducted by Muslims themselves. There isn't any doubt about that. And so one of the absolutely key things we have to do uh, is to gain the confidence of the Muslim community in this country such that they are willing themselves to lead these programs. And we gone a bit down this road. Mm -hmm. We haven't had, I mean, it's, we, 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 we've, in a sense, we pilot tested uh, what we need to do. We know it works, but it's got to be much broader. And that is why I can't help feeling in the end, if Muslims are going to be willing to do that, they must feel two things. One, that they are part of a, a broader society uh, and that actually they have you know, rights as well as uh, duties in the place uh, and that they are regarded as, you know, as, as equal Brits. Uh, and that uh, what they're doing is valued. Mm. Uh, so I think, I think there's, there's, it's, it's partly, a, um, a government can't do all of this, but it can give leadership. Uh, and it's, I think it's, it's the, it's the you know, getting, into the, getting into that little, that little corner that you've got to get into, uh, which I think is important. I don't know if that, I don't know, that responds to, to, to American experience, but it's certainly, I think, where we feel that you have to, you have to underpin the values of democracy by doing actually a special program. But I take it from your remarks that mm. there's a challenge in doing that and doing it well. Uh, there is. Uh, because there you is. run into the issue, you, you spoke of stigmatization mm -hmm. uh, in creating it. And I think obviously in the American context, as this issue has emerged, there's a great deal of fear uh, of that what Americans are going to do or what the U.S. government will do will lead to stigmatization of Muslims and will actually make the problem worse rather than better. Absolutely. And I guess if I could draw you out a little bit about sort of your thoughts. This is, this is not easy stuff. No, no. Uh, but just from, from your perspective, of, uh, from the British perspective, yeah. you know, what are the lessons you learned? How do you avoid committing the error you're, you know you shouldn't commit? Well, I mean, we didn't entirely avoid it. I mean, we, ha we have actually had this problem and, and uh, uh, I give you one example of where different parts of a strategy actually do damage to each other. Um, uh, as you know, we've had, uh, I mean, we have to have, you know, given, given the nature of the kind of, of plots that we've had to deal with, of course, that we've had a very vigorous pursue strategy alongside that, you know, which deals with directly with counterterrorism. Now, it's not too difficult uh, to find those things entangled. Uh, so that's one danger. Uh, second danger is uh, and, and, of course, exploited, um, you know, wittingly, uh, wittingly. Um, and there's been, there have been mistakes as well. I'll give you one, one example, uh, uh, the police force in one area in the, in the country put up a whole lot of CCT, CCTV cameras. They didn't explain what these, they were doing. These are doing. closed caption television yes, cameras? Yes, that's okay. right, and sort of, and they were, and it, it, gave, it gave rise, and it gave rise to the accusation that this is Big Brother. Uh, so you do have to be transparent about what you're doing. You do have, I mean, I think that, that uh, government does have to constantly to explain what's happening. It's also why, in the end of the day, you can only do it locally. You, I mean, it, it's really on the ground where the local community is operating mm -hmm. uh, and where there's confidence. The key, key component in all of this is trust and confidence. Uh, and we have to rebuild a bit of that because there has been, you know, there has been an erosion. Uh, I think we believe that you've got to start again. You can't just you know, accept that... that uh, um, having made a mistake, you abandon, the, you abandon the objective. But you can see we have tried to reshape the framework within which it's done 
uh, and put the put the what we believe to be the dominant thing, which is uh, getting the country together uh, as, as as the overall framework. And then there's, there is there's, there is prevent within it, uh, and we've we've changed the way the money is spent, and we have we have put the integration strategy into the hands of a different government department so that it's quite clear that you know this is a different activity uh, but I, I come back in the end to saying that uh, uh, we have to gain confidence and we have to work very carefully uh, at the whole business of personal and, and individual intervention I do believe at the end of the day this is a very granular thing you are dealing with people you're dealing with individuals uh, and and the best people to deal with individuals are those who are close to them, those whom they think have some regard for them, and they're the so-called role model. Uh, and so it's there that we have to go. And this is, we have to build this strategy. When, when you talk about reaching out to individuals, that's, as I understand it, the purpose of your channel program, to that's sort right. of engage exactly. uh, friends, families, the community. That's Can right. I just try out mm. a little bit more about how that works in practice? Well, it works. It, it literally works in in you know, long sessions mm -hmm. uh, with individuals, uh, debating issues, arguing, uh, going over the territory, coming back to the issue, um, and it's 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 hearts and mind stuff, but particularly mind stuff. Okay. Uh, what is this world about? I mean, it goes to absolute fundamentals about what people think they're there for. Now, if you start getting somewhere with someone, uh, what you then want to ensure is that they've got a job, uh, that actually uh, they feel their family has a future. So there are a whole sort of a series of other things that need to accompany that. So you start not just change the mindset, but also reintegrate. Uh, and so multi-agency working can be very important in this. Okay. Mm. Fair At this point, if you, uh, Minister, I'd like to bring the audience uh, into our conversation here. Uh, I would ask you to please wait for the microphone. When you get a microphone, to please speak into it. Please uh, stand, state your name and affiliation. And I would ask people to keep their questions concise and short, and that there be a question uh, so we can do as many of these as possible. Yes, sir. I promise the Minister I will keep her on schedule. <laughs> Madam Minister, Honor de Borgraf, CSIS. What can you tell us about the 400,000 Pakistanis who go back and forth between the UK and Fatah or other parts of Pakistan? And how does one persuade those people vis a vis those who live in England permanently and never go back to Pakistan? I mean, the. the uh Quite right to say, uh, the single largest uh, Muslim community in, in, in the UK is is, uh, is subcontinental, um, and there is a lot of modern communication and modern travel means that there's a lot of coming and going. Uh, we should be quite clear that it is a tiny, tiny fraction of those people who travel backwards and forwards who are up to no good. Uh, and uh, if you ask the average uh, Pakistani origin Brit. Uh, what do you think about that? They will give you the answer. This isn't, we don't want anything to do with this. And that's absolutely clear. What we have to establish, however, is the willingness of individuals uh, actually to, know, to come and, and say, there is a problem here. We think we've got, a, you, we've got a problem in our local community. And that's the gap that we have to bridge. And it does happen. It does happen. Some of the most important pieces of information that the authorities have ever received in the UK have come from individuals in the in in the, in the Pakistan community. Uh, and that's what, precisely what we want to encourage. So I think it is, it's a, it's a feeling that I can be on side. I don't need to be, I'm not ever going to be neutral, uh, nor am I going to be with these guys. I'm going to be on side with the rest of society. And that's the bit that we've got to try and accomplish. And I think, I have to say, that I do think that we've got a real opportunity at the moment. I mean, if you look at what's going on in the Middle East, there's a huge tide there that we ought to be able to do something about. It's preaching to the kind of, it's, of messages that we want to get across, uh, that you know, Islam, Western values can ride together. Uh, so I think that, that, that uh, uh, <coughs> part of, you know, part of our, our, uh, the way we go about this also, of course, is the way we interpret the world to our own, to our own societies and how they see, you know, how they fit in. Uh, so I think foreign policy, and I'm, you know, there's too much, uh, <laughs> not enough time to go into all these issues, but foreign policy and how government both explains and defends its foreign policy, I mean, is a, a, a quite an important part of, of overall mindset, and it particularly applies uh, when it comes to 
uh, and issue like Pakistan. British government is very, very clear that we have a strategic relationship with the Pakistan government in a cooperative enterprise against terrorism. Uh, so we don't set them as our, you know, as our opponents. We set them as our partners, and they are indeed. Uh, it's a difficult task between us, as we know. Uh, so I think, I, think that we, I think we got our messaging right on that. We just have to get that little bit more you know, link up, where people say, right, and I think there's something wrong here. I'm going to go and talk to the, to, to, uh, going to go and talk to the, I'm going to go and talk to the imam, and the imam I know will go and go do what's necessary. Okay, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Timothy Reuter, mm -hmm. and I, I've heard you say just now two things that sound to me a little bit like they might be in tension with each other. One is you, you talked about the narrative that uh, Al Qaeda and other uh, organizations put forward yeah. that first, Muslims are embattled and under attack around the world, and second, that the proper response is a violent one. And now you just talked about the fact that uh, Britain has a strategic relationship with the Pakistani government. Mm -hmm. So how do you take apart the narrative that you talked about for those who believe that the Pakistani government is part of what's oppressing Muslims in that part of the world? And now we've said that you, you have an explicit policy of backing them on or at least a number of issues. So how do you sort that out and explain it? Thank you very much. Well, having a strategic relationship with the government doesn't mean that you necessarily you know, endorse or back every single thing that happens under the roof of that country. Uh, I think, on the other hand, though, uh, I, I, I would um, defend very vigorously the, the, uh, uh, the, the Pakistan government uh, in, in its attempts to deal with, uh, with terrorism on its own soil. I think it faces a very, very difficult problem. Um, and their, you know, their uh, uh, difficulties are not going to be dealt with, uh, you know, with uh, at all easily. Uh, and it's part of our, you know, part of our policy to, to try and help. It, the, the situation in, in Pakistan is, very, is very obviously very complex. Because it's very complex, though, and because it's difficult, it is precisely why, on the whole, you need to try and help. And we, we help in all sorts of ways, including, of course, helping the underlying structures of Pakistan society. We put a lot of money into education. We put a lot of money into uh, trying, actually, to make uh, uh, the underpinning of, of uh, Pakistan uh, 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 such that you know, both education and economic activity are available to more people. I mean, these are absolute fundamentals. Uh, for getting, you know, for getting uh, a stable society uh, in that part of the world. Uh, and it's an important part of, of, of our policy. And I don't think we see any, any uh, contradiction between you know, that kind of long-term, like I said in my speech, there are no quick wins in this, that, that kind of long-term support uh, and, a, uh, and working together you know, against violence. I think we have time for one more question. Now, before I take the question, I want to remind everybody that uh, this session is on the record. And in fairness, I'm going to go to the back of the room since the first two questions came to the front. And the young lady, all the way at the end, last row. Uh, thank you. Cambria Hamburg with the Department of State. Um, what is the UK government's approach to engaging with allies, moderate voices in the Muslim community, or maybe some not so moderate voices, but nevertheless leaders who um, you know, espouse a nonviolent approach, but maybe do support a Salafi ideology. Thank you. I didn't entirely hear it, but I think it's 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 a question about the attitude to nonviolent Islamism. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Well, I think well, I think Pro microphone. Uh, clearly, yes. clearly, what we are what we are concerned with is the transition to violence, uh, and it's there that we will focus prevent money. Um, I did make clear, however, that one of the things, and this is, I think, a difference between ourselves and our predecessors, is that we do not believe it right to try and work through the agency of those who are themselves uh, on the separatist tendency or extremist in their views and use them as agents simply because they're not violent. Uh, I think we do believe that you can only do this effectively uh, with people who share your values and we want, obviously, for that, uh, um, um, we do, do believe that you know, the resources available, that Muslims who share our values will help us uh, and that we will be together in this. Um, but we're not, I think, partisans of the notion that somehow uh, uh, you can easily uh, get the right result 
uh, by trying to work through the agency of those who themselves don't share, uh, share your value systems. Um, and uh, it goes obviously to your analysis partly of how you think the relationship between extremism and extreme values and, extreme and at values that aren't ours uh, and actual, the actual uh, espousal of violence works. And we don't trust uh, the, the notion that somehow you can, you can effectively deal with uh, preventing and discouraging people from violence, working through those who uh, are, are not of, the, of, of your own value system. Minister, uh, I know you have a very busy schedule today. I want to say uh, on behalf of uh, all of the sponsors of today's event, thank you very much thank for giving up. Thank you for giving up. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.